Welcome everybody to Habitat Gardening for Birds and Other Pollinators. Um, your, your instructor today is Chip Grubbs, who's one of our horticulturalists here at the garden. And I'm gonna introduce him in just a minute, but my name is Kristen Barker. I'm the community education coordinator here at the garden. And I'm really looking forward to this class. I think it's gonna be great. Um, you know, it's kind of rounding out our bird month here at the garden where we had other virtual classes and um, kind of in person self guided activities like scavenger hunts and uh, photo contests and things like that. And it was really great to see everybody kind of interacting with with this topic so much. It was, it was really fun. So I'm looking forward to this this class today. Um, before I hand you over to Chip, I just want to kind of go over the format of the class a little bit. Um, I, you know, as a webinar, I encourage you all to use the Q&A if you have any questions throughout Chip's presentation. Um, you know, we'll be able to pause kind of periodically throughout to address some of those, but don't worry if, you know, we don't get to your question right away. We'll have a more dedicated section at the end to kind of go over those a little bit more thoroughly. Uh, I also encourage you all to use the chat. Um, we've gotten that started already, um, but Something, if you wanna kind of interact with your classmates in the chat, I recommend that in the drop down, you might see that blue bar, it says panelists. If you hit the drop down, it says panelists and attendees. And that way everyone can see what you're writing and you can kind of interact with each other a little bit more also. Um, and then also we are recording this. So if you know you miss something or you wanna go back and just kind of solidify some information, you can do that. Um, it'll be up on the digital content page of our website, calbg.org. And I typically have that up by the end of the day on Monday, if not sooner. So you can, you can find that there. And then lastly, uh, I typically send up a follow-up email. I'm sure Chip is gonna mention some references or resources. And so if it's a book or a website or anything like that, you don't worry if you don't write it down you know, completely, I'll send that information to you after the class, um, along with most likely, I think a PDF of Chip's PowerPoint. So you'll have that as well. Um, and I think that's it for me. So with that, I'd like to hand you over to Chip. Like I mentioned, he's one of the horticulturists here at the garden. He maintains a, a pretty large area that's kind of varied from, you know, uh, cactus desert garden to our wildflower meadow to, you know, kind of more, I guess, woodland chaparral areas that you might say. Yeah, yeah. And coastal and uh, Channel Islands Channel section Island. is yeah. big in my area. So, so yeah, he has, he has, I'm sure has a lot of observational knowledge as well as just learned knowledge about how our, our local wildlife is interacting with our native flora. So it's going to be a great talk. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Chip. Thanks, Chip. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Kristen. Um, this is my first time ever doing anything Zoom. I'm usually outside working with the plants and watching the birds. So thank you. Um, I'm Chip Grubbs. I am, my job title here is horticulturist too. Um, that's in between horticulturist, which is kind of the, uh, the first step and senior horticulturist. So hopefully I will be senior horticulturist soon. And I have been here at the garden for two years and four months and a little bit about the horticulture staff. We have six full-time horticulturists here and then we have a grounds manager and then the director of horticulture. And then we have a part-time um, intern. And then we have a records manager who keeps track of all the plants, all the plants, we, we call them accession numbers. They're all accession and they all have a tag. And then we can go into our database and see when they were collected and when they were planted and any um, notes on them. So uh, keeping the organization of the 86 acre botanic garden here. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I really wish we were all together today, but things being what they are, we're not. Because you know, right outside the window, there's some beautiful plants and hopefully one day we can all go on a walk. and. I just want to throw it out there that if I'm working and you're at the garden and you want to chat or with any people on the horticulture staff, feel free. We're plant nerds and all we want to do is talk about these plants. So um, go ahead and get started here. Uh, the Toyon, this is kind of, well, I'm going to be going through kind of the greatest hits 
of California native plants to bring birds hopefully to your home. And I want to make you feel and build your confidence to get some plants at your house. And you know, if you build it, they will come. I say, if the birds are gonna be around, if you plant these plants, cause that's what they want. So we have this toy on here on the left side. And as you can see, big old red berries and they have berries now. And that's, we're, we're gonna go a slide on toy on. So I will kind of save that till we get to the slide. And in the middle, scrub jay, that's my favorite bird. Super smart, um, a lot of personality. Um, they go after a lot of acorns. They're, they're really amazing birds. And then the Baja bird bush, I don't think you could get a better name uh, to get birds in your garden than the bird bush. And we're gonna talk about that specifically as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. And thank you all for being here. I really, really appreciate it. So why California native plants? The more native plants are always good. I see because a lot of people move to California from out of state or different parts of the country, you'll see, you know, East Coast plants or Midwestern plants or Southeast in people's gardens. And yeah, they'll have berries and seeds and nectar and things like that, but they use more water. I think we could all agree that the right plant in the right place are California natives in California and incredibly adaptable, low water requirements, and they can take these harsh, harsh conditions. I mean, you look at the mountains or you go on hikes and things like that, just scorching heat. And these plants, you know, they're pretty dried out. I mean, botanical garden quality specimens that we have at the garden, you know, they are irrigated. And we look at these plants all the time uh, to make sure they're healthy, excuse me. And an interesting thing about natives, but when I say adaptable, is you can, we're, when we go into the talking about specific plants, if it says full sun, you'd be amazed how a full sun plant can go into more shade. I wouldn't say a, a, a shadier loving plant could go into sun, but they are incredibly adaptable. And this next point is I think the ultimate goal in getting natives to in your landscape and getting birds in at your house, in your neighborhood, because they're gonna spread the seeds around. I mean, some of these seeds need to literally go through a bird uh, to sprout up. And a lot of the plants that we plant at the garden, the vast majority, say 99%, all come from containers. So we're already taking them and putting them someplace that they, that they didn't naturally come up on their own. So I think one of the most exciting things, if I had, I don't really have a home landscape because I have such a responsibility here, but if a manzanita or a California lilac popped up in my garden on its own, I mean, that I, I wouldn't be, I couldn't be happier. And that is really the goal. And there's a myth that California natives look bad at certain times of the year. Don't get me wrong, in the scorching summer, they, they do have... Uh, techniques to save water and and go dormant and they can get pretty dried up and not look too great but as we'll see with with these plants and these slides coming up they do look good and I hope that we can get them into your into your garden so so food for wildlife we're gonna we're gonna break this up into uh, berries seeds and nectar so you really do have a mix and having uh, berry seeds and nectar at all times of the year in your garden, because if a bird, it's interesting, you'll see if they come one time a year, they remember, they'll come back and more birds will come back. So, and then protection for wildlife. This is something that is really, really important and something about California natives. A lot of them are evergreen. So that's some, and not just, you know, conifers and things like that, they're evergreen. So the bird wants to nest in these plants. And we'll talk about that more as well. And you want them to stick around. And I feel like if we can get some, and it would just take a couple different species of plants and different genera to, to make them want to stick around. 
So we will go on to the next slide here. So birds you can expect to attract. This is an, another thing I wanna mention. I, I am not a bird expert. I hope that isn't a disappointment to anybody, but I am around these plants full time. I'm obsessed with them. And I see these birds all the time. So I, I am kind of an amateur birder. I wouldn't call myself an expert at all. Like I said, I hope that's not a disappointment, but it's the truth. So California scrub jay, we saw that on the first page. Beautiful, uh, like the little, the little white eyebrows there. So and bush tits, a little bird. California thrasher, they have a lot of personality too, and you can definitely see them with that the hook beak. I see them rooting around, uh, scratching around in the ground. California towhee, uh, spotted towhee. That's that's kind of everybody's favorite around here. Uh, Kristen mentioned they they do their little dance and they're rooting around in the ground and just really fun and they have an interesting call. Uh, American Robin, our um, intern Muriel, she's really into birds. And she said to me, she said, if you see it, uh, Robins in your garden, that is a sign of a very healthy garden. So um, hummingbirds, we have Anna's and Allen's. We have some water features here. We're gonna talk about the importance of water features later, but they just love them. You, we have water features in the morning, you know, I'll get here at 6.30, 6.45 in the morning. And they could be up to, you know, 10 hummingbirds, just all, you know, splashing around, taking a bath, having a drink. Uh, really cool, really beautiful. And here's some more Western bluebird. I see these sometimes. And that's the other thing about these birds. When you're around, they kind of want to go away, you know, very shy. Uh, California quail, we have a lot of these at the garden. Uh, they're very skittish, very, very skittish. Uh, lesser goldfinch in the house finch. You'll see them on the seeds, a lot on the wildflowers. Uh, Lawrence's goldfinch, hermit thrush. I mean, how cute is that little that little thrush? Uh, Northern mockingbird and uh, bantail pigeon. And I have one more slide of birds here. Uh, Faina pepla. I mean, that is just an amazing looking bird right there with the red eyes and black and the and the crest and uh, golden crown sparrow, California gnat catcher. Acorn woodpecker, we have a lot of woodpeckers around here. They definitely, um, they like the sycamores. Uh, Dark-eyed junco, black phoebe. Hooded oriole, I have not seen hooded oriole around here, but that doesn't mean they're not around. I have a friend who lives in Duarte and she sees a uh, hooded oriole. And a uh, black-headed grosbeak, kind of looks like a towhee. Really pretty bird, so. This is definitely not the full list as well. These plants that I'm gonna talk about, like I said, are kind of the greatest hits. Not a full list, but definitely uh, something that you can expect to see. So we will go to the next slide here. And I was thinking about how to do this, um, how to break this up. So I go by scientific names and the horticulturists here and botanists, we have to go by uh, scientific names because a lot of plants do have the same common name. And I thought, am I going to do you know, scientific names alphabetically and just have a list of all the plants or common names, just a, just a list, A, B, C, D, all the way down? Or how do I want to break it up by sun exposure, water requirements, um, soil type? And um, a, a person commented on the Instagram saying, what berries, seeds, and nectar do they like, the different birds like? So I said, you know what, we give the people what they want here. And I think it is a really good way to break this up. So we're gonna start in on some plants here. We're gonna talk about the chaparral current and the California fuchsia, but I just think these are really pretty pictures and amazing plants. So we're gonna to go to the next slide here. So we saw that Toyon on the first page, um, it's Christmas berry or Heteromelies arbutifolia. And right now this is a must if you want a berry bearing tree in your garden that has food for birds right now. And I always, you know, do the quote unquote winter because I'm from the Midwest, I'm from St. Louis. Um, so I don't really consider this winter, but this, this tree right now has berries all over them. We have them all over the garden. Uh, 15 by 15 feet, that's max size. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk, or I'm gonna talk about 
when we're talking about max size for these plants, that doesn't mean that they have to get that big. Um, so the Toyon Evergreen Shrub, it can definitely take the full sun. I mean, they get pretty hammered out here, but we do irrigate them uh, about once a month in the summertime. And we're also gonna talk about um, a new planting, water requirements for a new planting versus an established plant. And they're definitely two different things. So the Toyon has white flowers in the summer that the butterflies and bees love and then showy red berries in the fall. And they exist naturally throughout California, except in the deserts and they're a vital food source for birds. I see them around, you can get one gallon for a pretty good price. You can probably get some five gallon and we're gonna talk about nurseries and California native plant nurseries later, but just an amazing plant, tooth leaf. You can see, I'm gonna use my little pointer here. Uh, nice uh, leaf here. On the right side, this Davis Gold cultivar. And we're gonna talk about what a cultivar is. I might as well just say it right now because you're gonna see a lot of cultivars. And you see these little apostrophes and a name. It's a cultivated variety. So that's something that a plant scientist or a horticulturist or a botanist bred or saw in the wild that had desirable characteristics, let's say um, a desirable flower color or uh, a dwarf species. So they'll stay small and then cuttings are taken to that. So clones are taken to that. So every cultivar that you have, it's basically all the same plant. You know, if you have a, we're gonna get into manzanitas, but if you had a, you know, Howard McMinn manzanita and your friend had one as well, they're the same plant. So what's cool about this Davis Gold is a lot of people see Toyon and the vibrant red berries, Davis Gold is yellow. So why not have both? Get both in your garden. This is probably the number one, easy to take care of, uh, takes well to pruning, soft wood. So you're not, you know, cranking on your wrist to be able to, um, to take care of these plants. Beautiful, amazing. I see birds all over these all the time. Uh, definitely want this in your garden. I'll go to the next slide here. So this is probably everybody's favorite plant in California is the uh, manzanita or Arctostaphylus. Staphylus means berry. So that just shows you right there. And uh, manzanita, it's a large and diverse genus consisting of evergreen shrubs varying from low and prostrate. Prostrate means on the ground the tree-like, and they are slow growing. And the form of the crooked stems and the dark red or chocolate colored bark is amazing. That's probably what people like the most about them is you can see this picture on the right, the, the bark and the form, amazing. Especially when it's raining, the glossiness of the bark, it's, it change your life, okay? <laughs> really amazing, excellent specimen. Uh, tree. Uh, full sun to part shade. We have them kind of in a mix, but they're definitely full sun. Uh, manzanita can take full sun, and we're going to talk about their care requirements as well, about how to tell when they need water. And there are many cultivars with desirability for home landscapes because they stay small, stay smaller, and we're going to get into some of those. And the flower here, that's called an urn-shaped flower. And the bees really like it, hummingbirds. It's really funny to see a bee try to, try to get inside that little hole there. Um, and uh, so they're blooming right now and they're going to fruit or making the berries right now as well. And it's amazing how fast they'll go from having flowers to being pollinated to having berries. It happens pretty fast and so you see uh, manzanita means little apple in Spanish. And you can see with this middle picture why they say that. So let's get into more manzanitas or Arctostaphylus species. So if you want a large one in your garden, reliably over 10 feet would be the big berry manzanita or Arctostaphylus glauca or the peri manzanitas. And there are multiple cultivars of peri manzanita that you could find. And also about cultivars, the availability is what you're really looking for. And I would say if you, you go to a nursery and you talk to somebody that works there, even if it's not a Bird Hill or a Dr. Hurd or a St. Helena, 
get it. Get a manzanita in your yard. It's planting season. We're going to talk about planting as well. If you want birds in your yard, you need a manzanita. And they're really cool to look at. And once again, very slow growing. So you can see the form on some of these. And in some of the other slides and pictures, a lot of them look the same. But when you get up close, like I said, we're on Zoom. It's impossible to see them in person today altogether. But you can see the different form here. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful plants. So that's going to be over 10 feet. And then we're going to get into three to 10 footers, which is probably which, what you're going to want in your garden. So this kind of shows, and this isn't, these aren't even all the cultivars. But there's six here, Howard McMinn, Sentinel, John Durley is really popular. Uh, Lewis Edmonds, Sunset, and Island Manzanita. Island Manzanita is uh, Arctostaphylus insularis. Beautiful plant. I have a few of these in my coastal and Channel Island sections. And they do very, very well. And they're blooming right now and setting their fruit right now. So these are all really reliable to have in your garden. And then we're going to get into some of the smaller ones right now. Let me get a drink of water, excuse me. So ground cover manzanitas, my favorite ones as well. They're all my favorites, but they stay small. They trail on the ground. They're prostrate. They give protection for birds. You'll see a lot of birds, you know, rooting around for insects and seeds and berries and things like that. And they'll just go, they'll go right back into the Arctostaphylus and they're evergreen. So they're going to have leaves all year round. So Carmel Sur, this is a cultivar of the um, Little Sur Manzanita, which is Arctostaphylus edmundii. Really nice can take a little more shade. Mine, are, mine get morning sun and afternoon shade, and they're beautiful, putting out new growth all the time. Pacific Mist, I'm not really too familiar with this one, but as you can see, you got a couple of plants here on a slope, um, creating a nice nice little mounded plants here. And then Kinnikinnik, this is Arctostaphylus uva ursi. This is, a lot of manzanita have really small distributions in California. Kinnikinnik or Arctostaphylus uversi has the largest distribution. It's in Asia, it's in lots of parts of the world, and it's definitely one that you should get. And you can even tell from the Carmel Sur, kind of that pointed leaf to the Kinnikinnik, and that's another thing about the manzanita, when you get up close to them and you can see them, the little differences, not just in form or bark color, because some of the bark will be more vivid red, some will be brown, brownish red. But if you can get your hands on these smaller uh, ground cover manzanitas, you definitely should. Okay, before I go on to the next one, kind of the care requirements for manzanita, they don't really need a lot of your help pruning wise, because they are so slow growing, you want them to push out as much growth as they can. Um, I haven't had problems with uh, disease that I think that I have caused through pruning. Point is, you don't want to do a lot of pruning or cutting back in the wet season or the rainy season. We haven't had a lot of rain, but if it's raining or you're getting ready to water it, don't do a lot of cutting on it because they can, you can spread disease uh, spores in the air. You'll see dieback on manzanita, which is, which is totally common. But if you can, if you can help not doing that, that's definitely a tip. Cut on your manzanitas when it's dry in the summertime. And I water mine, my established uh, manzanita that are year, years and years old at the garden, about once a month or every two weeks depending on uh, what kind of sun. If they're getting a lot of sun, it might be every two weeks to a month. We don't have a lot of manzanita in containers. I know that might be a bummer uh, to people, but we haven't had a lot of luck with manzanita in containers. I don't think they like the wet feet and they really thrive in poor soil. So when you do potting soil and things like that and water it a lot, you might overwater it. And when when they die, they die fast. So I don't know if I would uh, recommend 
manzanita in containers. I'm sorry if that's disappointment to you. And uh, on the first page, we saw the Baja birdbush. This is my absolute favorite plant. Amazing. Everybody needs one now, right now. See if you can get your hands on one. Call around to nurseries. It's related to a manzanita. Amazing in every way. Evergreen. It's an excellent specimen plant. Bees love the flowers. They flower in uh, late winter and spring. Birds love the berries. Uh, ornitho means bird. Staphylus means berry. So bird berry basically can definitely take the full sun. They're native to uh, the San Diego, Tijuana area. And from what I understand, there's only about a hundred known in the wild. So think about how rare that is. They're, they are critically endangered. And if we can get more of these plants into our home landscapes, that's gonna bump up the numbers. I, I don't, whether it's at your house or in the wild, more plants of something that's rare, the better. So about 10 by 10 is uh, when, it's, when it's mature, like a manzanita, very slow growing. I know this middle picture is blurry, but this is a, this is a uh, ornithostaphylus at the garden. Amazing, that white bark, stunning. Amazing, amazing, amazing. I highly recommend this plant. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about currants and gooseberries. Uh, these are ribes species. Uh, birds love these plants. Hummingbirds love the flowers. And then when they go to seed and form a fruit or a berry, uh, birds are all over them. Uh, many are perfect for home landscapes because as you can see with the size here, uh, you know, fairly small, five by five, six by six, um, flowers in the uh, winter, early spring. They're flowering right now. They're not setting any fruit, but that's to come. Um, my personal favorite, is the fuchsia flowered gooseberry, that's uh, Ribes speciosum. The, the only thing about this is you definitely wanna have this off a pathway or near where people could be because it has extreme thorn action going on, uh, but beautiful flowers. You'll see the hummingbirds go after each and every one of these flowers, amazing. Uh, white flowered currant, that's uh, Ribes indicorum. So a white flower, uh, chaparral currant, uh, this is a Ribes malvaceum species, beautiful. They have a really uh, unique leaf shape and some leaves are smoother, some are more woolly and hairy. And then the red flower and current here, you can see that bee on there. Uh, everybody needs a Ribes in their garden as well. Like every single plant I'm gonna talk about, everyone needs one. So the, so this, the same, some of the same from the slide before, but with their fruit, so you can see the spines on this uh, fuchsia flowered gooseberry, but the birds love them and they, they start to get kind of stinky when they get really ripe. And I, I'm sure the birds are attracted by that. So now we're gonna go on to uh, coffee berries and red berries. These are Frangula and Ramnus species. Uh, they're widely distributed in many plant communities and it can adapt to many garden conditions. I will say a little shout out to Peter Evans, the director of horticulture here. He loves, uh, he loves coffee berry a lot. He loves frangula. So you, he, he would tell you to get a frangula at your house. You can see this coffee berry here on the left. There, let me wait for this to go away. So, I mean, 15 by 10 is max. You can definitely prune them. That's another thing that I was kind of going to wait to talk about, but, you know, get your hands on some pruners. I know we did a class a little while ago on pruning and pruning techniques and things like that, but I see a lot of people, they get very hesitant when they need to cut their plants back. And a lot of the job here at the garden is cutting the plants back because they are so healthy. You know, they start growing into each other and growing into pathways and things like that. And you can do research on how to correctly prune, but the best way is hands-on experience. So do, do not be afraid to cut these plants back to the size that you want them to be. So this one in the middle, Eve Case, this is a cultivar that stays smaller. So the coffee berry on the left is a Frangula californica that, you know, 10 by 10, let's say. The Eve Case is a dwarf. So five by five, 
And look at those berries, a nice like brownish red, amazing. And then spiny red berry, um, another nice one, uh, six by 10 foot. If you can get your hands on any one of these, I would highly recommend that. Excellent plant, excellent, excellent. So we are gonna move on here. So roost species, you'll uh, sumac, uh, worry-free evergreen shrub, perfect for hedges or screens. They're uh, pretty worry-free around here. I don't see any problems with them with disease or uh, they just do their thing and they can, they, they're definitely drought tolerant when they, when they mature. They can definitely take the full sun, but you can put them in a little bit of shade too. Flowers in the spring. Uh, pollinators love the flowers. Birds love the berries. You can see some fruit here on the lemonade berry and the sugar bush. Lemonade berry is uh, Rus integrifolia, kind of a cool scientific name. And sugar bush is Rus ovata. And then the pink flowering sumac, those are the flowers. Uh, Rus lentii is the scientific name of this one. And you can see kind of the differences in the flower. The people like the lentii because uh, it's a little more pale green with some of that venation uh, standing out. We have uh, lemonade berry and sugar bush all over the garden, do well, they do really well. Um, so I would recommend that as well. We are gonna move on here to prunus or holly leaf cherry and desert peach are two uh, that we have that are nice. I mean, you see a word like cherry. If a plant has a word like berry or cherry, that is definitely a go-to, kind of speaks for itself. So the holly leaf cherry is an evergreen shrub or a small tree. It has lush growth, uh, tooth leaves, white flowers in the spring, uh, drought tolerant, but definitely accepts water and appreciates uh, summer watering. I water mine uh, deeply and well about once a month. That's, that's kind of your rule of thumb, um, especially if plants are a little more inland uh, once a month. And then as you get to more coastal where the temperatures are a little cooler, you know, twice a month, uh, accepts uh, shearing and heavy pruning. And depending on the soil type, the size and shape will vary. So if, if it's in a more wet spot, they'll, they'll get bigger. If it's in a drier spot, they'll stay smaller. Um, the cherries are big um, and birds like them. A desert peach, we have a couple nice uh, specimens here at the garden. They do go winter deciduous. Uh, they can take full sun, they're drought tolerant. Uh, maybe grown in clay soils if not overwatered. Because clay soil is going to hold on to the water more than a sandy sandy soils. I think that's uh, pretty logical, and that's about six by six. And then a few more here, uh, berberis or California barberry. There there are quite a few species of these, and they do have these. Uh, Oregon grape is one of the common names. I like them. I just think if you have a smaller garden at home, maybe not the best because they excuse me, are pretty spiny and uh, can definitely hurt you. And uh, creeping snowberry or some Phoracarpus mollus, um, definitely in a more shady spot. I have them in my uh, coastal and channel island section. Beautiful plants. They can lose some of their leaves in the summertime when it's warm, but a little extra water helps. And summer holly, uh, Camara staphylus diversifolia. This is related to an or, uh, to a Baja bird bush and a manzanita as well. Uh, maybe a little more rare to get your hands on, but if you can, in lieu of a bird bush or a manzanita, beautiful, beautiful tree. And then we have the elderberry here. This gets really big, 20 by 20, and it's deciduous. So I don't know if that would be the best for your home garden, but uh, Sambucus. Birds love it. Anything you research, it'll say, this is definitely a go-to. So, okay, so now that I've gone from berries to seeds, I think we could stop for a second. And also, I just wanna uh, say, if, if you ask me a question, I'll tell you straight up if I'm not too sure, and I will be more than happy to, uh, to get back to you. So if we want to uh, open it up for a second.
Yeah, we have a few questions kind of, uh, you, you touched on some of this, but just to kind of solidify it for people. Yeah. Um, so will Toyon tolerate pruning to keep it a bit smaller about how small would, you know, how small can you prune it back? I mean, you, I've seen people and, and at the garden as well, you can kind of create like a small bonsai. I don't mean bonsai, like tiny, but you can definitely shape them and bring them down in size. What was that about uh, 15 by 15 or 10 by 10 was for the toy on. You could bring it down to six by six and I would experiment as well. You know, toy on is it's a pretty worry-free shrub. So I would not be hesitant to, uh, to work your magic on it. And you can definitely, definitely bring them down. I don't know if, you know, three by three or something like that would be, would be good, but you could definitely, I don't know about half the size, but somewhere around there, maybe half the size. I mean, that's what pruners are for. That's what horticulturists and gardeners do. So uh, give it a try. Right, great. And then um, you kind of touched on this also, but just to clarify, about how often do you water your manzanitas? Okay, um, great question. And there is a lot of, um, I wouldn't say controversy. There's a lot of discussion here at the garden and in literature over the decades about when and how to water uh, Arctostaphylus species or manzanitas. Right now, we're not doing anything to them. We haven't had a lot of rain. But if you dig around in the ground, it's, it's definitely still moist here at the garden. So we let everything be, but definitely in June, July, August, September, I mean, those hot where it's 95 for a day for six weeks. I water mine once a month in the morning <clears throat> for about four hours. I use rotor sprinklers. Um, I'll water for about four hours at about four and a half gallons a minute. I mean, it's on a pivot, but they definitely get deep watering once a month for a few hours and dig around, see, see what kind of soil you're dealing with. Um, give me just a second. You'll find that people say, you know, don't water your manzanitas overhead or don't hit the crown. Don't, you know, too much water is bad. Obviously you don't wanna you know, hammer the base of the tree with a sprinkler, but once a month, you know, two, even two weeks, I would say once a month is good. If you hand water with a hose, I, I do mine once a month, once a month in the summertime. Great, for a few hours. cool. Thanks for that. Um, and then- I what, hope that was, I hope that helped. I think so, yeah, I think that probably helped. Um, and then, what about, what's your opinion of golden current? You kind of mentioned some other, um, Chris, do you have any, any thoughts on golden current? Good question. Uh, that's um, Ribes aureum. Uh, we, this might this be a sad, sad thing for people to hear here. I kind of treat it as a bit of a weed here. We have it in the back. If anybody's ever been to the garden, the back majority of the garden is called the plant communities it pops up everywhere and they turn into really big bushes. I think at a home, at a residence, in a small backyard, I just think it's gonna to get too out of control. But like I said, that's what pruners are for. Uh, Ribes or uh, golden current is nice. Have a little more of a, a shiny, uh, slick um, leaf. But personally, I think they get a little too out of control. Gotcha. And then do you know, I, I think I have the answer, but um, are the currants and the gooseberries that we're talking about, the variety, yeah. these are edible for humans. Is that right? Uh, yes. I personally don't eat anything here <laughs> at the garden, uh, but I know people who do. Uh, so yes, I can't say from personal experience or or recommend it, but but I have heard things, yes. Yeah. And I think actually, so we do this Taste Wild series where we, yes. we put native plant ingredients into various recipes. Yep. And so uh, currants and gooseberries were talked about for an upcoming event with, uh, for jams. So they are edible. I just don't know how the best way to prepare them to make them 
you know, optimal, I guess. <laughs> sure. I don't either. I have heard that, that they're trying to, they're, they're wanting us to uh, keep an eye out for uh, the golden current with berries so they can try it with, uh, with the taste wild. Jodia? And so we have um, a question about, so someone's asking about Mexican elderberry. So she's saying LA has added it to their protected species list, but not sure just what plant that is. Um, is the elderberry that you're showing here, do you think that's, is that the one? She's Let curious. me, because from what I understand, uh, Sambu, uh, Sambucus nigra used to be Sambucus mexicana. So I think we're actually talking about the same plant. Okay. Um, we have them here in, in, not in my section, but I mean, they're big, they're big. I mean, 20 by 20. I mean, if you have the room, um, I'm not really sure about availability, but that's a, that's a big, that's a big tree. That's a big tree. And what I'm kind of focusing here are smaller things that you can kind of pack into your, uh, to your backyard. Okay, great. Right. And, uh, I think that's it. We had some great comments about, you know, um, somebody who had sugar bush, even yep. in crazy heat waves, it didn't get scorched. So that's a yep. great plant. Yep. Um, but I think in uh, a cultivated ribes have much bigger fruit and less seeds. So that would probably be good for, for human consumption. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Thank you for that comment. Yeah. So I think that's it for now. So thanks, Chip. Those are great. Okay. Hopefully I'm not going too slowly. Hopefully everybody's having a good time. Here we go. Okay, so California lilac or Ceanothus species, another big favorite. Need you need one at your house, okay? So we're gonna do like we did with the manzanita with large, medium, and small. So they're evergreen or semi-deciduous in the summer. You'll find that some of the older leaves will get yellow and drop off in the summertime. Uh, sun depart shade, beautiful flowers in the spring. Some of them are blooming already, or some are starting to set their set their buds. Uh, they're great on a slope or a bank. Uh, do not overwater in the summertime. I find a lot of visitors to the garden it happens a lot over the past two and a half years almost. I've gotten this question multiple times. My ceanothus up and died on me, and we'll kind of get into a conversation, and they have a drip system or they're watering a lot. Don't overwater your ceanothus. And it provides good uh, cover and nesting sites for many birds. The bees love them. I mean, look at these plants, amazing. And don't prune them harshly. I've read that. I don't really prune on my ceanothus because they're newer planting, so I want them to get big. Um, but we're gonna go into some literature that I, that I like um, at the end of the talk. But in this literature, they say, try not to prune too much on a ceanothus. If you, if, you, if you have to, you have to. That's another thing. If you have to prune on them, you have to do it. If it's growing in a path or you know, hitting you in the face when you're going by, but don't prune back your ceanothus too hard. In, in the literature that I like, it says nothing bigger than the size of a pencil in, uh, in thickness. Then another thing too, one of my colleagues mentioned, when I talk about ceanothus, talk about the different smells and we're going to get into when we talk about sage we're going to talk about that too a lot of different smells uh, between species so island ceanothus sierra blue is a cultivar that's nice 10 by 10 and snow flurry beautiful beautiful so we have some medium-sized ones these are probably be more recommended for your house and i know a lot of these pictures they look the same except for that snowball but trust me, when you get up in, in the face of these plants, uh, slight different hues of blue and purple, uh, dark star, the dark star on the bottom left, that is uh, on the horticulture staff, that's probably all our favorite. Just a really vivid, deep blue. Um, Julia Phelps, that's another one that's available. Like I said before, cultivars being more available. At, uh, at California Native Nurseries. So highly recommend one of these. Okay, so ground covers or, or low growers. Anchor Bay, that's my favorite. We have some at the garden, in the cultivar garden. I hope 
a lot of the people that I'm talking to that are local have been to the garden. The cultivar garden is where to go if you wanna look at a lot of these cultivars. And there's a lot of good signs, so you know what you're looking at. Anchor Bay, that is the one. That's the one to get. Uh, Carmel Creeper is another nice one. Sorry, it's kind of blurry picture. Uh, Yankee Point is also really popular. So you can get something that stays small. Um, very, very nice. California Lilac is another must. Everything's a must. This one's definitely a must too. <laughs> okay, so buckwheat or Ariagonum, we're getting into another species here. Uh, few ornamentals have such showy flowers, handsome seed heads, attractive foliage and pleasant forms all in one package. They're evergreen, full sun to part shade, adaptable to many soil types, but prefers well-drained, so rocky or sandy. They're doubt tolerant to occasional summer watering. Mine get about once a month again, but in the morning for a few hours. And that's for an established plant. And we're gonna talk about at the end about uh, new plantings versus established plants. So they have new spring flowers, but they'll hold on to the flower flowers for a very long time. You can see buckwheat, I swear, uh, like the St. Catherine's lace that will hold on to those uh, flower heads. They'll change color, they'll, they'll turn kind of a brownish red, but I swear they'll hold on to, to them for years. And uh, buckwheats attract beneficial insects and are of substantial value to wildlife. They provide food for butterflies, pollen and nectar for bees, seeds for birds and mammals and cover for many creatures. So you have California buckwheat right here. That's the one that you'll see probably most on the, on the slopes here in the mountains. Uh, St. Catherine's lace. Beautiful, uh, big leaf, big flower head, six by six. So look here at all the different colors that you can have. Uh, red flowered buckwheat, that's a Ariagonum grande var rubescens, deep green leaves and compact. Sulfur buckwheat is um, Ariagonum umbilatum, another beautiful plant, really these colors. So we're talking about, you know, Get a couple of these in your garden. I mean, look at this color array that you can have. Ashy leaf buckwheat uh, is Ariagonum cinerium. That's my favorite species. It's compact. And as you can see, three by 10. So it, it's going to want to spread. And then saffron buckwheat, that's Ariagonum crocatum, one by two. So that's nice and tiny. These would be nice in like a, a little rock garden or something like that. So now we're gonna talk about Encelia, uh, two species that we have a lot at the garden. Uh, Incencio, or Incienso, is uh, Encelia farinosa. Between the two that I have here on the page, I would definitely pick uh, farinosa. A little more dense, dense with the foliage, nice color, like a silvery, silvery green. And both of these take really well to coppicing. Uh, coppicing is when you, after they're finished blooming, you can deadhead them if you want where you cut off the flower stalks, but I will occasionally coppice them. That means you don't cut them back right to the ground, but you, want, you can leave you know, a foot, you know, six, eight inches. So what that helps to do is you're keeping the root system intact. And then all those plant hormones want to, bust up and send out new growth because both of these species, especially when they go to seed, will start to get really lanky and um, not that great, but that's what, like this one on the left, the, the uh, Incienso, you can see how it's nice and compact. I mean, maybe that's a picture in the wild, but that's what you could expect to find, especially if you coppice them, which is a pruning technique. So baccarat species or coyote brush, uh, one of my colleagues, Patty Sue, uh, super knowledgeable, uh, great lady. She said, you have to talk about baccarat. So coyote brush has significant value in the habitat garden. It's frequently used in restoration projects because it spreads rapidly and quickly provides food and cover for a variety of birds, mammals, and insects. Evergreen shrub or dwarf brown covers, uh, full sun to part shade. We have them in the garden where they get hammered by sun for sure. Um, small white flowers in the fall, and they take well to shearing or pruning so they could be good on a pathway or um, 
something like that. The inconspicuous flowers, you can't really see them that well, but definitely a nice plant. You have Pigeon Point and Twin Peaks are two cultivars that are really popular. We have um, a lot of nice specimens in the cultivar garden. Again, if you come to the garden, um, my colleague Damien uh, takes care of that area. Great guy. And the cultivar garden is definitely a popular spot in the garden. So sagebrush or artemisia, um, it's quint quintessential component of the coastal sage scrub community. It's aromatic, evergreen, uh, full sun to part shade, drought tolerant, inconspicuous gray, yellow flowers in the late summer and fall provide a critical supply of pollen, nectar, and seeds for a wide array of birds, insects, and mammals. And it produces many volunteers. So they have volunteer vegetation as you know, when a seed comes up on its own. So if you don't want, if you have these in your garden and you don't want them it taking over, make sure you pull those seedlings. So you have coastal sage scrub here, Artemisia californica, about three by three. I know that picture is a little blurry, I'm sorry. Canyon gray is pretty popular. It's, pro, it's a prostrate. Um, the thing about these two species, uh, very brittle uh, foliage. So if somebody steps on or it's close to a pathway, it can break really easily. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And then Douglas uh, Mugwort, uh, Artemisia Douglasiana is another popular one. Uh, three by three, probably gets a little bigger than that, but, and it spreads. Um, we will, Artemisia is popular. We have a, a lot of it comes up on its own here at the garden. So, okay, so now we're going from seeds to nectar. So if we want to stop for a sec. Sure, we just have a question about buckwheat. Um, yeah. do, do they, can they do well in shade? Um, I don't know about, definitely not full shade. A lot of mine will get morning sun and then afternoon shade or morning shade and then afternoon sun. My section of the garden has a lot of oaks and a lot of uh, shade breaks is what I call it. You know, when the shade, you know, tree, tree uh, creates shade. We definitely have uh, buckwheat out in the communities, which is very open in the back of the garden. A lot of... Uh, California buckwheat. And that's what you see up in the mountains or up in the, in the foothills. If it, I could be afraid if it was in too much shade, it wouldn't, it would just be reaching for the sun and it would, you know, get kind of lanky. Uh, ed ediliation is what that's called when it, when it uh, wants to reach out. Definitely more sun than not. Definitely more sun than not. Okay, great. And um, any of the plants that you've mentioned so far or anything that comes to mind um, that you would recommend to plant in containers? I mean, a lot of these uh, definitely, you know, you see the Ceanothus uh, cultivars that say a little bit smaller. I think personally, I don't have a lot of experience planting in containers because we have, you know, because it's a botanic garden and we plant directly in the ground. Um, I, I definitely mentioned with Manzanita, probably not to go there. Maybe p other people have had really good experiences in containers of manzanita. We just haven't had it here, but I could totally see buckwheat in a container. Um, no problem. Give it a try. I just don't have a lot of experience with that here at the garden, but I would, I'd give it a shot. I mean, you talk about buying a one gallon plant at a nursery, you know, maybe what, $10 for a one gallon. I mean, I know, you know, times are tight and everything like that. That's another thing. Thank you for paying to be here. Um, but I would give it a try. I would give it a try. There's, that's what experimentation and getting your confidence up is all about. So I would give it a try. Have at it. Great. And then um, what kind of plant would do well under a large California oak? Okay, uh, great question. Um, so that would definitely be more shady. I'm going to talk about shady, shade loving plants or the plants that like more shade toward the end. But say for the uh, current and gooseberry section, I did not have this slide or I did not have a, a picture of this plant. And I'm sorry about that. But um, 
what is it? Per, per, give me just a second. It's Ribes Vibernifolium, Catalina Current. I would definitely maybe write that down. They love it underneath oaks. Love it, love it, love it. Um, the, the foliage smells really nice. I don't even know how to describe it. It's almost kind of like a raspberry lemonade. It's really weird. Um, more inconspicuous flowers than the other currants and gooseberries. But out of what we've talked about, and, and it's available in nurseries too, uh, Catalina Current, I would def, Ribes Vibernifolium. I know that's a big word, but that does great under oaks. Go for that one. Cool. All right. Thank you, Chip. Yeah. We ready to go? Yeah, yeah. there's some questions, but I think we, we'll hold on to them for, for the end. So Sure, sure. Okay, so about nectar, we're going to talk about salvia. It's one of the most popular uh, plants for California native gardens. Given plenty of sun, there are some exceptions. Reasonably well-drained soils and little supplemental water once established. It can be evergreen or semi-evergreen. You know, they can drop some leaves in the hot summer. Adaptable to many soils. Uh, use them as ground covers for bank and slope planting as accents or container specimens. So there you go, nice in a container. Uh, mast in borders or raised beds. And most importantly for uh, wildlife habitat. Hummingbirds and bees love these flowers. I see hummingbirds all the time on these and uh, birds eat the seeds. So a lot of these two, you know, we were talking about the, the currants and gooseberries, you know, the hummingbirds will love the flower and then the bird will love the berry. So a lot of them can cross, which is really fun to have food for birds and pollinators throughout the year. Uh, they bloom spring through fall. They're very aromatic, almost to the point of uh, being kind of nauseating, <laughs> to be honest with you, because I work with these all the time. Sometimes they can, uh, the, the smell can stick with you for sure. Uh, you want to deadhead and head them back after the blooms go to seed to produce more vigorous, compact growth. Um, and with a lot of these plants, you, you don't want to cut off all the blooms right when they you know, start not looking great because you want them to go to seed and you want them to have, you want birds and other animals to be able to get at those seeds. But in order to create a more compact plant, you know, cut off that flower stalk um, after it's finished and, you know, leave some as well, but that's how you can create uh, more compaction. So you have white sage, uh, very aromatic. I know everybody likes white sage is a very unpopular opinion. Not a fan. I'm not a fan. It's very, very smelly. Uh, black sage, uh, salvia mellifera. It's California's most common species, about five by five. You can see that, you can see the hummingbird on the white sage, um, but nice flower there. Get into some more here. So uh, Cleveland sage, it's uh, salvia clevelandii. As a mounding habit, green to ash gray leaves, purple flowers. Uh, three by four, uh, purple sage, uh, salvia leucophila, four by 10. So you can see it wants to spread. Hummingbird sage, um, this is, okay. So we were talking about under oaks. I have uh, hummingbird sage, which is salvia spathacea, underneath oaks in my area and they love it. Definitely want more shade than they do sun. So this is definitely a go-to, nice big green flowers. Interesting scents with all of these different smells for sure. Uh, Munza's sage, uh, salvia uh, munzii, nice and compact, three by three. It can tolerate uh, heavy or clay soils, bluish flowers. Okay, we have some more here. Uh, Alan Schickering, it's a mounding habit. Uh, blue purple flowers, that is a nice flower, if I say so myself right there. Uh, three by four. Okay, Terra Seca. It's um, a cultivar of Salvia mellifera or black sage. Um, I only became aware of this at the garden a few months ago. Beautiful, beautiful species. This is the one. Highlight that one. Great plant. Two by six, so you can see that it spreads. Uh, Dara's gold. Again, like we were talking about the lilacs, about the Ceanothus before, how a lot of the pictures, they look the same but I promise you they're not, you know, you have different hues of flower color. And 
different leaf shape and texture and smell. So you have Mrs. Beard here. It's similar to uh, Dar's, Dar's Gold, uh, two by three. Okay, so penstemon or beard tongue. This is another really popular one. Uh, there are colorful evergreen perennials that make up the largest genus of flowering plants in North America. Their tubular, two-lipped, open-throated blossoms attract bees and hummingbirds. Cut back the flower stalks after they have seeded to encourage new growth. Uh, full sun to part shade. We have uh, Penstemon uh, spectabilis, a Penstemon spectabilis. That, that's a species in the back in the communities. It comes up everywhere in the summertime and it gets hammered by the sun. Uh, spring, summer bloomer. Don't overwater. I had problems when I first got into uh, planting penstemon by overwatering new plantings and they and they just rotted out on me. So Cleveland's beard tongue, uh, blue green leaves, vivid pink flowers, uh, two by two. That's a uh, penstemon clelandii. Uh, Margarita bop. This uh, cultivar is uh, we love it here at the garden. Garden favorite for sure two by two. Uh, once these have gone to seed, you can, you can, I take a, a long pair of scissors and I'll just cut the blooms off. I mean, look at that color on that blue, blue, purple. Amazing. Hummingbirds love it. Okay. Firecracker penciling. See all these different colors. Like we were talking about the, the buckwheats, all the different colors you can have. And this stuff is available too, to get. So firecracker penciling. Um, this is Penstemon etonii, dark green leaves, upright form, amazing red flowers, three by three. I mean, look at that. Uh, desert Penstemon, this is a uh, Penstemon insertus, uh, light green, almost uh, silvery, narrow leaves, beautiful pale purple flowers, uh, nice compact form there, one foot by three foot. So here's some more just kind of a, uh, uh, couple different ones instead of going into uh, slides on species. Just kind of some, some other favorites here. Western Columbine. Here's another one under oaks. Beautiful. You go up to Ice House Canyon in Baldy. Uh, you'll find these. Prefer shade and heavy soils. In the summertime, I have them. They get, they get a decent amount of shade, a lot of shade. And I water them with a fixed irrigation. I call fixed irrigation like dug in irrigation with a valve and everything like that. I'll water them about once a week in the summertime for about 45 minutes. Uh, evergreen to semi evergreen blooms pretty much year round, uh, three foot by two. And you'll notice when this flower, I mean, look at that flower. Looks like a rocket ship or like outer space something. Um, you'll see when it goes to seed, the flower stalk will want to die back. And then you'll see that some of the leaves will start to die back as well. And if you pull back that foliage and look down at the base or the crown of the plant, you can see a lot of new growth coming out. So again, I'll take a pair of scissors like I did with the penstemon and I'll cut that all out. You definitely reduce the size of that three foot high by two foot wide down to just a little tiny you know, little tiny little plant, you know, maybe six inches by six inches, but that just helps it just boom, come back to life. So bush monkey flower or diplicus, this is another uh, favorite around the garden. A lot of volunteer vegetation, it comes up by itself. The one thing about diplicus is it does not look good in the summertime. Uh, even if it's in a more shady spot, it'll almost look dead. So just be mindful of that. And from what I understand, some of my colleagues, uh, Patty Sue, told me don't harshly cut back Diplicus or you can, uh, you can kill it uh, through over pruning. So that's about two by two, two feet by two feet. So pitcher sage, uh, another big hit around here. People love it. It's Lepicinia uh, species. It's fragrant likes partial shade, mine get a lot of afternoon shade, um, large fuzzy leaves, uh, coppice after full bloom to encourage new growth. What you'll see is after the flower stalks are finished blooming, um, when, did I, when did I cut mine back? 
maybe two months ago, I cut mine back because again, you can pull away that foliage and look down to the base of the plant and you'll see a whole lot of new growth down there. So if you cut off the flower stalks, you can encourage that to grow again. And then those are going to shoot back. Those are going to shoot up to just create the cycle all over again. Uh, because you're keeping the root system, you're basically just encouraging that plant to just revive itself. So California fuchsia, uh, this is epilobium. It's fast growing and spreading. You want to coppice it hard in the late winter or the spring. We, because uh, they get really lanky and the growth starts to die back. So we coppice them or cut them back to the ground really, really hard. Um, over the past few weeks, everybody in the garden has been uh, cutting back their epilobium. Uh, one foot high by three foot wide, that's just the foliage itself. And then the flowers will, uh, will come up. Hummingbirds love them. Hummingbirds love all these plants. So some more, so island snapdragon, this is a Gambelia speciosa. Uh, bright green leaves, prefers sun, can be in the shade, but if it's in the shade, it's gonna produce less blooms. So spring or summer blooming, evergreen, three foot high by five foot wide. I cut my minor near a pathway. So the only real pruning or horticultural care that I do is I just cut them back off the pathway, okay? Uh, alum root or hookera, this is another one that'd be nice under oaks. Uh, definitely prefers the shade. Uh, regular watering, especially in the summertime. Uh, there are good cultivars out there. There's one called Wendy, and then there's another one called Santa Ana Cardinal, which are popular. The bees love them. I have them in my uh, Channel Islands and coastal section, and they're getting ready to bloom. They're starting to send up that flower stalk. Uh, the bees love them. They'll seek out these little tiny white flowers. So uh, heartleaf kekiella. Uh, prefers more shade, uh, bright red tubular flowers, and it has a vining habit. Only thing about it is it goes super dormant in the summertime and it looks dead. People, you know, we have it in the back of the garden on the mesa and people, you know, they'll do their walk around the garden and they'll come down to the kiosk before they leave. And they said, there's a big mass of dead <laughs> shrubs up there and they're talking about the kekiela because man, I'm telling you, it dies back. Not dies back, it goes dormant. But right now, I, they're not dead. They're sending out tons of new growth. Beautiful plant, highly recommend. Uh, California honeysuckle, this is a lanicera, a hispidula, I believe is the species on this. Uh, another one that's in a decent amount of shade in my section, um, it does go deciduous and it's vining. Uh, spring and summer blooming and it has little berries uh, four foot high by eight foot wide so it's definitely spreading a spreading plant so some more uh, coyote mint is a monardella um, full sun to part shade mine get morning sun and afternoon shade a regular summer watering say mine in the summertime now, once a week for a half an hour with uh, fix, fixed irrigation sprinklers. Uh, rose purple flowers, one foot high by three foot wide. Hedge nettle, which is Stacky's Bellata. It's an evergreen ground cover. Uh, spring to fall blooming. Lavender flowers, uh, very interesting scent. It's uh, in, the, in the mint family. Uh, two foot high by four foot wide. I would probably say the four foot wide can be even bigger. I mean, it sends out a lot of new growth that root up and then that will go on and on. Uh, woolly blue curls, huge favorite at the garden. Uh, Trichostoma linatum. Uh, it's fragrant, very interesting smell. The bees love it. Evergreen subshrub, constant bloomer, takes well to, uh, to pruning prune back those uh, flowers after they've gone to, uh, when they're starting to go to seed and leave some as well. So you can get some, some to pop up on their own. Uh, appreciates regular watering. I water mine about once every two weeks in the summertime. And uh, Dudleya, it's our native succulent. There are quite a few species out there. They'll go kind of summer dormant and look eh, a little iffy in the summertime. About one foot by one foot for this uh, species in particular. Some are a little smaller. Yeah, varying uh, 
uh, leaf color, a beautiful plant. So that's kind of the end of the nectar ones. Do we want to we want to take if anybody has any questions? So um, with the California fuchsia, mm -hmm. you're cutting that back around now, right? Like, yes. yeah, okay. Because you'll see them. Um, um, I have a cup, a, a big mass in a section, in a part of my section of the garden, where it looks okay, but that older, but that growth, it starts to dry out and it looks bad and the dryness will keep coming back down the plant. And if you, like I was talking about with the, the columbine and the uh, pitcher sage, if you look down at the base, if you pull the foliage away, you can see all that new growth wanting to come out. So cut that stuff all out and let those, let that, you cut it back pretty close to the ground. We might, we might cut it back maybe a couple inches to the ground of a plant that's, you know, a foot off the ground. So you definitely want to cut that back to just uh, encourage more vigorous growth. Great. And you, you've kind of mentioned a lot of great uh, shade plants like alum root and hummingbird sage and the uh, uh, Catalina currant. Do you have a sage that does well in shade? Um, well, I mean that uh, the hummingbird sage would definitely be there for you. The terraceca that I mentioned, there are places in the garden where it is in more sun, but I would I would recommend that for maybe a little more shady spot. I just, you know, something like white sage or black sage or any of these full sun sages, if they're, if they're in a lot of shade or underneath the tree, I'm just afraid that they won't, they'll just stay small and they won't be vigorous bloomers. And I know that might not be the answer uh, you wanna hear, but the more sun, the better with the sages. That's why that hummingbird sage, the uh, Salvia spathacea is the, is the perfect, the perfect one for that. Great. Yeah. And just so somebody wants to clarify, when you were mentioning the uh, coyote mint, what did you yes. mean when you said trailing? Like, how would you explain that? Um, it'll, it's, it's on, so it'll be on the ground and it'll start, it's kind of like prostrate, how, how I was talking before about stays on the ground, but you know, like how a ground cover will trail along the ground. I, you could, um, you could substitute the word, you know, ground cover habit to trip for trailing. Gotcha. Thank you, Chip. That Good. was it for now, I think. Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk about oaks for a second. Um, amazing, amazing plants. The problem is they get really big. I mean, it takes a long time. And especially in Southern California, I mean, all over California, there's probably oaks a lot closer to your home than you think. I mean, our uh, native species to the site here in Claremont is Quercus agrifolia, the coast live oak. Um, and then more into the mountains, you can get the, the canyon live oak here in the middle, the chrysolipus. Uh, but birds eat the acorns, they eat leaf galls, birds pick insects off the leaves and twigs, they use a tree for nesting sites, pick insects out of the bark, use the bark in which to store their acorns, like the acorn woodpecker. Many birds use oaks. The list is endless about how many birds do. Um, because they can get very big, scrub oaks are the best option. Uh, they stay small, they stay small. So a scrub oak or species of oaks that stay under 15, about 15 feet, you know, I think we can define a tree as something that stays under maybe 20 feet or 15 feet. So here, the scrub oak or the Quercus berbertifolia, it's a small evergreen tree. It has really dense foliage, an open branch structure. It's deeply rooted, uh, acorns in the fall, like all your oaks. It can take the full sun and it has tooth leaves. That's the one drawback is those, those tooth leaves, very painful. I mean, I'm from the Midwest where oaks, you know, they have big leaves and they're really soft and they wouldn't hurt you in a million years. These scrub oaks and other species of, you know, uh, bigger oaks, some of these leaves can really be painful, but that's another thing that the birds want. That's like, it's like a castle. 
for the birds. Um, I mentioned uh, Berberus or California barberry earlier, maybe not having it in your backyard because it could be a, something painful to interact with. Birds love barberry um, and they love these scrub oaks, um, but you just have to keep in mind that they can they can cause you pain when you when you work on them. So wear gloves. They make they make big gloves with. I have uh, they have these like leather protectors for your hands. That's what I use. So another one. Hold on a second here. So with that Berberta folia, the scrub oak, that's ten foot tall, eight foot wide, and you can prune it. You know you can uh, shape it to to what you want the size to be, a little bit smaller. Then you bump up to something like the middle one, the Quercus chrysolophus, a canyon live oak. You'll see these up in, up in the mountains there, um, right across the street from the Baldy Lodge in the parking lot. That's what, the, that's what those are in the parking lot is chrysolophus. Uh, huge acorns, beautiful trees, uh, full sun. I've seen these available at nurseries, but 30 by 30. I mean, that's eventually going to be a big, big tree. So another option for an oak that gets big is a mesa oak, a Quercus anglominii. Uh, it's evergreen, has open structure, uh, nice bluish green, uh, non-toothed leaves, and it's a specimen tree. And when I talk about specimen trees, you know, that's something that, you know, that you would have, in, you know, it's not a hedge or something like that. It's something that's gonna be, you know, for, for everybody to see. And, but that's big, you know, 30 by 25, which is basically 30 by 30. Um, so now that we're getting toward the end and thank you so much again for being here. So this is an important slide. So a good start for your own native garden is at least one species in the following genera. Get a manzanita, get a lilac, a buckwheat, a coffee berry, um, a currant, a beard tongue, a sage, Maybe leave the oak out of there, but that is going to give you a really well-rounded uh, native garden. And a one-gallon plant, let's just say you know ten bucks. I mean, you can you can start a garden for a decent amount of money for not a lot of money. It's really possible. And with all the and using a combination of these plants by layering them can allow you to have various species in a small space. Okay, for example, you know ground cover in the foreground medium-sized shrub in the middle and a large shrub in the background. So you can kind of create um, a layer, like a step up that will give a lot of cover and a lot of food. And I'm telling you, it's possible. I really, I think if you all came here to see this talk, um, I think you're into it enough to give it a try or you already have natives. You know, I don't know what range of experience level I'm talking uh, to when I'm staring into a computer camera, but it's definitely possible. I want you all to know, you know, have confidence. Um, it's possible to, to bring the birds. Like I said in the beginning, if you build it, they will come. So some more suggestions, a uh, good way to get birds into your garden. A feeder doesn't hurt. Okay. We have feeders at the garden in the front by the kiosk. Now it's, uh, a little further into the garden, but a bird feeder never hurt anything to bring them in. You know, you're trying, you're trying to uh, convince them to come and stay. Um, and a water feature. I have a, a friend who loves birds and she'll say often, and she really doesn't have many California native plants. Um, she has oaks in her backyard, but she says the birds come for the water. And I know water features can be expensive. I mean, I was just looking at Amazon not too long ago. And even a smaller feeder can be a couple hundred bucks, but I know there are videos and um, documents and plans out there about how to make your own, you know, with a pump and some rocks and, you know, digging a, you know, place for the water to be underneath where you can get that cycling through, where you can have running water. Birds will come to the water, I'm telling you. Um, so some planting tips. No, I mean, I know we haven't had a lot of rain, but this is still technically planting season. It starts from about October to, you know, March, April. Last year we had uh, late rains. We basically got January rains in 
you know, March, April. But when you plant, I know there's tons of suggestions out there about, you know, dig the hole twice as big and twice as deep and all this. We, the horticulturists and I, we kind of joke that the perfect planting job is a hole that's the exact size of the pot. Maybe a little, honestly, a, you want, what you want to do is be able to dig that hole, put that plant in there and just shove it down a little bit. So it just goes boop right in the hole. Um, you always want to use the native soil, you know, don't be putting potting soil or anything in the hole. Um, don't put any organic matter in the hole when you're, when you're planting back in, you know, make sure leaves and sticks and things like that. <clears throat> don't go in there. Um, especially, I will fill the hole with water before I plant every single time, literally, unless it's actively raining. Okay, and I've done plenty of planting in the rain around here. Dig the hole, fill it with water one or two times. That's another really good way of how to um, see what kind of soil type you're dealing with. If the water drains fast, that's more of a sandy soil or a rocky soil. If the water doesn't go anywhere, and we've, I've, we see this all the time here, where you'll fill the hole with water and it takes forever for it to drain. So that's more clay. So, and even moving, it's, it's pretty interesting. You can just move a couple feet away and you might run into a slightly different soil type. So that's always a good idea to dig around and see, to see where uh, a lot of these plants like fast draining soils more than clay soils. So just give it a shot. And I create, and you'll see this in planting diagrams and things like that. <clears throat> you create a water basin around it. I see a lot of people that will make a big basin. I like to mine to be a little bit smaller, you know, a ring around a one gallon plant. So when you water it, the water just doesn't uh, go away. And over time that um, catchment or that little berm will erode away on its own. Uh, but that's definitely something that you want to do. And a new, okay, watering tips, new planting versus established. Um, when we started planting in October, new plantings, I don't care what it is, you know, water at once a week, twice a week sometimes, and then keep an eye on it. And what you'll notice is, and this is another little tip, if you see shoot growth or, you know, new leaves, or putting out new growth above ground, that means that the roots are active below ground because the roots inform the shoots and the shoots inform the roots. So if it looks healthy above ground, that means that it's, that it's good below. And there is really no hard and fast rule on when to water and how you're gonna have to decide, dig around in the ground. I, I have trowels and shovels I'll walk through my area sometimes and just dig holes everywhere, okay? Just to see the moisture level in the soil. You know, you really need, there's, you know, another myth, especially by California natives, you plant it and walk away and it'll be fine. You know, it's a native, it's a survivor. It's used to really harsh conditions. Yeah, but that's a, a seedling that, you know, pops up on its own. You're taking a plant that was in a, that was nursery stock, that was probably in a shade house being taken care of by nursery men and women, uh, babied, you know, they're doing their job amazingly to give you a nice plant to buy. But then comes your work. You know, it's not, it's time and effort, but it's definitely time and effort well spent. So those are some tips there. And then so, these two books here, California Native uh, Plants for the Garden. Uh, this is definitely a go-to. See, I have mine. Hold on a second. I have mine right here. Okay. This book is great. And then sadly, because it's not really too available, the California Native Trees and Shrubs by Lenz and Durley. Uh, Dr. Lee Lenz, he was the director here for a long time. He passed away not that long ago. I believe he was 103 years old. He's definitely a... Uh, um, a legend around the garden. This is my copy. I know it's not that easy to find, but look around online. I, I'm telling you for, for all the people that are here today, if you, if you emailed me and said, hey, can you give me some information from these books? I would, I would get it to you, okay? 
I would definitely get it to you. Um, but other resources, obviously this Botanic Garden, Calby G and its staff. Um, like I said in the beginning, we're all big plant nerds around here and we, I would love to talk to each and every one of you. Um, I will show you where these plants are, no problem. Uh, I, I think you can see that I like to talk. Um, <laughs> um, Grow Native Nursery, that's the nursery here at the, at the Botanic Garden. Um, since COVID, everything changed and I, I, okay. So you can see the, the inventory online and, and pick up your, your orders here. I was in the nursery the other day and they, they had a really nice selection. Uh, other California native nurseries, I don't wanna start rattling off names because if I leave one out or leave some out, I'll feel bad. But there are definitely native nurseries in Southern California that have beautiful, uh, beautiful plant stock. Uh, Calscape and Calflora and Las Palitas. These are, I have direct links to these on my phone. Everybody who's into California native plants, use, the, use this as a resource, these, uh, these websites. So with that, we can take some more questions and I really appreciate it. Thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Jeff, this is great. I mean, we do have some, some questions. Sure. Um, try to get through some of these. So uh, we have one of our friends here planted a butterfly bush in full sun, watered regularly, and it died over the winter. Do you have any suggestions on what might have happened? And just kind of what's your general opinion about butterfly bushes? So butterfly bush, I'm, I'm assuming we're talking about I, on the, the non-native. I yeah. believe I, I believe that's what we're talking about. When I grew up in the in the Midwest, I worked at a nursery that had tons of butterfly bush. Um, here's the thing: even from an experienced horticulturist like myself and other people who have been working with plants for years and years and years, plants will die. You know, and sometimes it's you know plants will get sick and die. Um, uh, Kristen, it said the the question was: it died over the winter. Yeah. Died over the winter. Uh, maybe, I mean, I doubt anything like frost down here. I mean, maybe watering at the wrong time. We, we've, we've found out around here um, at times that a very formidable time in artificially watering is from summer into fall. There's like this weird time where maybe the plants go a little bit dormant. Uh, uh, before we think they do or something like that and we water them and the and the roots aren't actively uh, uh, taking in that water and that soil water and the nutrients and you know you get some get some root rock going on but um i would be more than if that if that question wasn't answered sufficiently i definitely uh, would take more time with that person if they want my email or something like that we can chat about it more okay great thanks um and then so um, we have, so let me think, uh, there's, what would you recommend as a faster growing oak tree for a park, for a park, um, that could be, could take full sun? Is there uh, anything that are kind of a little bit faster to grow? For a park, for sure. I mean, let's, um, this is another resource that I use. This is from like 1999. It's the tree of life catalog, which is another nursery. Let's, uh, let's look at some Quercus here. So um, Quercus agrifolia, you know, coast live oak, um, Chrysolopus that we said, the canyon live oak, a blue oak, um, Quercus deglisii. It's more in Northern California, but we have them at the garden and they do well. Uh, California black oak, well, that's a little more slow growing. Um, a valley oak, you know, Quercus lobata, which is uh, California's largest oak species. So that's going to get really big. Um, uh, Quercus uh, wislizinii is another. That's the interior live oak. Um, I would say if you went to a nursery and they had an oak that wasn't a scrub oak that stays smaller, get it. You know, you can't go wrong. The, the vast I mean, these oaks all can take 
full sun. I mean, they can really get hammered on. The prop, the only thing, like I said about the blue oak being more Northern California, you know, you have to keep that in mind because as you go South, it gets warmer and drier and more arid and more of that uh, chaparral um, environment. But yeah, something like a Labata, you know, if you can, if you find an oak at a, at a nursery, grab it, grab it up, grab it up. <laughs> Great. Get them um, all. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody has a one-year-old Toyon that gets watered by an automatic sprinkler daily. So would you say that's getting too much water? That is definitely too much. I mean, how, how old did you say it was? One-year-old. One-year-old? Any, any about the size? Uh, no size. Okay. Um, yeah, once a day is definitely too much. I mean, and that's the thing too. Maybe if it was once a day for five minutes or something. But the, the other thing about California natives and pretty much tr uh, plants in general is another rule of thumb for watering tips, deep and infrequent, okay? Deep and infrequent watering. You want that water to infiltrate way down in there and then you want it to dry out. Not that you're, you know, it's like taking a breath of air for the plant when it brings in the water. You don't want to put it to the brink every time of dryness and, uh, you know, permanent wilting point and things like that. But once a day, once a day, for sure, for sure, uh, uh, too much, I would say. I would have to take a look at it. If, you, if you're from down here, or if you want to send me pictures or we can chat, but that's, I would definitely say that's too much. So she said it's very tiny, about six inches tall. Six inches tall. Um, I mean, yeah, it, and it's in the ground um i'm not sure yeah yeah it's probably in the ground if it's in a pot that's that's kind of different you're talking about a container plant but for me for a toy on that's a year old that's only six inches tall that to me says you know definitely like stunted stunted growth oh it, sure. it is in the ground so yeah that yeah that sounds that doesn't sound like a great situation for that plant Okay. Sorry. So, um, well, you know, we're kind of running short on time. I, there were a few questions in the, the early on that I don't know if you might not have the answer, Chip, but I can definitely provide a resource for this. It's so local gr bird groups are telling people that they need to take down their feeders and baths because okay. of an avian pox and salmonella that's going around. Um, do you have any, like any knowledge about that or? I do not, to be quite honest with you, I would definitely, you know, take the, take the guidance. Um, I could definitely maybe see a bird bath, no matter, like stagnant water versus when I talk about a water feature, you know, definitely, uh, running water, uh, cycling and, and circulating. I am not uh, too familiar with that, but if that, if that's, if that's what they're saying, you know, people that know birds better than I, I would definitely uh, take the guidance on that. And I'm sorry to hear that that's happening. Yeah, me too. I mean, one thing I would say is Tina Stoner, who is the president of the Pomona Valley Audubon Society, was here two weeks ago to do our intro to birding talk. And I'm sure she would have some information about that. So I can reach out to her and ask that question. Um, and then I can send that all to you and follow up on that because yeah, that's that's an interesting, um, interesting I'm sorry thing to hear that. that might be happening and want to give you the right information for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, you know, I think you know, that's about it. Um, we had a lot of great questions. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you to Chip. This was so informative. Um, I, you know. I think everyone ha can walk away from this with a lot of ideas about what to plant for their various their various situations at their home. But like Chip mentioned, he's he's available for any follow up questions. Um, I will be sending an email to you all with Chip's PowerPoint in a PDF form, and you, so you'll have this as a resource to check back on. You can also watch the recording again, which will be up probably by the end of the day of, on Monday, but honestly, I'm typically able to get it by the end of the day up on our website. So I'll send you that link where you can find that. Um, 
Uh, real quick, if I could mention something real quick. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I just want to say again to everybody, thank you so much. And I know, you know, some people are local, some people aren't. You know, come come to the garden. Uh, become a member. You can volunteer. I I want to meet you all. I, I This place is really important to me. And I, you know, the people that are here, when it says there's 25 people here, um, I really appreciate you all coming today and uh, the comfort of your own home. And I wanna implore upon you all that you have the confidence, you can do it. You know, we can do this together. Thank you. <laughs> totally, yeah, definitely. I, I, I think that's a great ending note. So um, if you have any questions, you all have my email and I'll be sharing Chip's email with you in the follow-up email and you can reach out to him. Um, but thank you, everyone. This has been great. Thank you so much.